Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. I'm Erica Chenowitz, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our third Topol webinar uh, seminar. Um, today's topic is going to be um, the effects of COVID uh, and activism on uh, the survival of democracy in India, uh, among other topics. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Just a brief overview of the series. Uh, and a few thank yous. Um, this is a, a part of the Topol Fellowship uh, for which we are very grateful to thank Sydney Topol and the Topol Family Foundation for support of student research uh, and inquiry about the use of nonviolent resistance around the world. Uh, today's Topol Fellow whom we're highlighting is Anayat Subiki, uh, who has convened an uh, extraordinary group of people to talk with us about uh, the topic of nonviolent resistance as it relates to India today. I also want to thank the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, particularly Sushma Raman, uh, Jana Brown, Larissa de Silvera, Silvera, and Alex Geller for their support of our event today. Um, today's co-host, Anayat Sabiki, is a recent graduate of Harvard Kennedy School and uh, she has curated a conversation that we hope will contain not only lessons for nonviolent resistance in India, uh, but also lessons for, uh, about nonviolent resistance for others struggling for justice around the world. So with no further ado, I will pass uh, the conversation to Anayat, who will give us a brief overview of the context in which um, nonviolent resistance is relevant today in India, uh, and then she will introduce our two speakers. Anayat. Thank you, Professor, and hello and welcome everybody. It's so good to see so many people tuning in. Uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about some parts of democracy in India, both <clears throat> as to what was going on before the pandemic hit and what the response to the pandemic has revealed to us. I'm going to very broadly lay out some context before handing over to our speakers today. I'm going to be using some images and figures, the source and credits for which are in the Google document in the chat box. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see that the centerpiece for the policy response to the pandemic was this major complete and total shutdown, uh, which was announced on 25th March when India still had about less than 1000 cases of the virus. All public transport was shut, both local and interstate. Uh, all offices, businesses, and commercial establishments were shut. While some of this might sound familiar, what perhaps is different in our case is that people were given barely hours um, to <clears throat> get uh, to adjust to these new uh, orders and any violation of these orders was going to be treated uh, as, a, uh, as a criminal offense subject to imprisonment and enforced by the police. Uh, what this led to was complete and total chaos. Uh, as you'll see in the next couple of images, with the shutting down of all industry, the millions of people who uh, depend on daily work lost their source of income. Uh, they were not able to pay rent. They were plunged into food insecurity. And just to survive, people need, were forced to return to their home states. The figures, the extent and the severity to which this was going to affect people was no big secret. Uh, as per the census, there are at least 56 million interstate migrants. Um, that, uh, as per world development indicators, at least 70% of India's workforce is classified as vulnerable. This emergency situation of people trying to get home didn't just last a few hours or a few days, it went on for weeks. Uh, all through April, people were forced to literally walk back home hundreds and thousands of miles with everything they own on their backs and taking their children along with them. This led to what is going to be a blot on our conscience for a long time to come, which is the preventable deaths of at least 824 people as per this tracker, uh, which has been maintained and visualized by student volunteers. Uh, people died not because of the virus, but because of starvation, because of exhaustion, injuries that they sustained after being beaten up by the police uh, for being out in the streets. 
all these deaths were avoidable. These people could be alive today uh, if the lockdown was better thought out and better reacted to uh, as, as the situation changed. Um, if we're thinking about the democratic practice, uh, this is yet another example of how the burden of failure of poor policy falls on um, just always the poorest, often fatalistically, um, and those who impose it remain unaccountable. I'm going to pause here and take you back to uh, what was happening in the days, weeks, and months before the pandemic struck. This was from Shaheen Bagh, which ran uh, for 101 continuous days and nights, a protest largely led by young Muslim women uh, against the discriminatory and anti-constitutional uh, citizenship amendment laws. Um, students from across the country joined these protests uh, with solidarity marches in a way that's been unseen in recent uh, memory. Uh, this is from Kochi in Kerala, uh, Azad Medan in Bombay in the next uh, in Mumbai on the next slide, um, and this is Kolkata in the east. So really, people from all parts of the country were out on the streets. Um, and though the specific trigger was this anti and the citizenship amendment law. This is part of a larger story of what's been going on of declining democratic and civic space in the country. As you will see on these indicators, uh, we have been doing poorly on press freedom. Uh, the Economist Intelligent Unit has degraded us to a flawed economy. Um, and the rule of law index also rates us really poorly. The repression to this popular and uh, civic resistance was swift. Um, hundreds of people were detained. Uh, in Uttar Pradesh, about 25 men were killed, allegedly in police firing. And something new that we saw this time was the shutting off of the internet in large parts of the country where people were beginning to gather in large numbers. The, while the protests and the uh, popular uprising have been paused due to the pandemic, what hasn't is the repression. Um, many, many people have been arrested, including these three young women, Safura, Devangana, and Natasha, who led pockets of this anti-CAA resistance. Uh, they've been arrested under anti-terror laws on grounds such as creating discontent, disrupting peace in India, conspiracy, and so on. This appears to be sending a very clear message to the millions of young people who came out on the streets just a few months ago. So where are we? Uh, today, India's uh, main policy response to the pandemic, which is the lockdown, is being lifted. Um, the health crisis is only increasing. Our number of infections are rising. We're the fourth highest in the world right now. And we need to look at all of this together. The inability to contain the pandemic, the inability to provide economic and social security to people, and the diligence with which people who are critical are pursued need to be seen together when we think of democracy in India today and what it's going to look like as we emerge from this pandemic. With this, I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Nikhil Day, who is a founding member of a <clears throat> rural workers collective in Rajasthan. He spent decades mobilizing for minimum wage and basic rights, but also built and led national coalitions that have got us some of our stronger welfare and transparency laws in the country. He's someone I've worked with and deeply admire. Uh, so over to you, Nikhil. Nikhil, you're muted. Still muted. Um, now can you hear me? Yeah, sir. So thanks so much, Inayat, Erika, Rinda. It's great to be with you and with everyone else. We can't see, but we'll hear hopefully later on in the program. Um, I will try and go very quickly through what has been an enormous, very short history uh, in the world, certainly, but I think very unique in each place uh, 
across the world and India with its huge population has been put through a series of experiments uh, and they seem to be experiments with authoritarianism and top-down governance to sort out people's lives. And as many authoritarian experiments show, they've gone horribly wrong and we are in the midst of them. And therefore, this is not so much about the pandemic, which has its own dynamic, but it is about the response to the pandemic. And it's the response to the pandemic in a certain scenario that exists within India. So the since we are looking, actually, I am going to talk mainly about labor and workers. Uh, obviously, within this uh, framework where we talk about India being one of the largest most vibrant democracies, not just in terms of the vote, but in terms of so many vibrant things that happen, genuinely do happen from its people, but also in terms of how people have made various efforts and what they faced during this pandemic, and particularly with the lockdown. I mean, the lockdown, as we've all heard all across the world about how important it is, how necessary it is, how much one must keep to it, but in India, it just came suddenly, literally with four hours notice and with great pride in being absolutely able to lock down the entire country, actually completely. And instantly, whether anyone else knew or didn't know, the migrant labor who, who are called migrant labor, but actually they are labor and, and they're migrants in various ways, uh, roughly 100 or 120 million of them realized that there was little hope of them lasting even a three week lockdown. So they began to move and they began to move instantly in hordes. And instead of recognizing that the government, because it was insistent on being able to push through its policies without any thought, closed down entire transport and said, no, we will go through with this. So much like we had an, had an exercise on demonetization where everyone had to follow that same route. This was another exercise where everyone had to follow. But for the people, what it, it brought two things out. I think for the rest of the country, suddenly these people were emerging from packed little rooms and from uh, hutments and tenements and factories where they were living and construction sites where they were packed together onto the streets to start getting home because they had no other hope. And for the first time, India realized that its growth rate of the last so many years was actually at the cost of a whole lot of people and on the backs of a whole lot of people that they had not even seen or noticed or understood. I'm not going to go, you saw the pictures that Inayat showed and I think the world has seen that but people in India living on those very products that, that were being brought, made by and manufactured by all of these people had no clue where they were coming from and what working conditions. And despite seeing it, it was certainly a class issue. So the lockdown meant nothing to the set of people. It could only be a disadvantage because they were locked together. So there was no question of physical distance happening for them. And in fact, it has held true that in terms of a public policy measure, it has given them the virus and it has brought them as soon as they could move or they desperately move back home. It ca they carried the virus with them back. So in every possible way, if you were to do a proper evaluation of what the lockdown was as a public policy measure. It was completely of no advantage to labor. As soon as they started moving, there was a utilitarian response from the state, which was very much a ruling class response that where are these people going? How will we restart the economy if they go home? So you were only concerned about locking them in, which of course you cannot lock down huge numbers of human beings like that. And there was no understanding of how they would survive for those three weeks, except passing orders to an already tottering industrial complex that they had to feed and give wages to them. There was nothing done either on that side. So people had no food and they lost all their indignity in standing in lines for little, little bits of food and going hungry. They had no health. They were completely insecure and they were frightened by a health uh, scenario that existed uh, where, they, where there was this, uh, this uh, very, very high level of not, not enough knowledge, but 
an idea that could give them any kind of distancing and th being thrown out of whatever insecure accommodation they had. And when they traveled, no access to travel either. So it was a situation and scenario which was horrendous. And they left for home in these large numbers with indignity, insecurity, and the most telling line which was on everyone's lips, that if we have to die, we may as well die at home. We would rather die at home. So it's not like they had some great hope when getting home. And that's why this term, which has again come from the West of social distancing is so deadly in India, because actually it is a social distancing is what has existed, what allowed this terrible situation to arise with, with the people there. Back home, what has happened? People have come with no money, with no employment. They left their homes because they did not have employment. And the little employment that existed amongst people, that was also gone. Local governance and resources, non-existent because the central government has introduced an entire a taxation scenario where all the resources are with it. So the capacity to be able to put pressure on the state governments is minimal and on local governments non-existent. So how do you actually use your own local resources to recover? And let's look finally at the state. Uh, you know, I have about five minutes, is it? Or three minutes? What? I, I, five minutes, seven minutes. Okay, great. So, um, so you have a situation of a completely authoritarian entity saying that we know what is good for you saying that we will tell you you have to stay locked down because it is good for you and when seeing that the effect it was having on people saying no please make this sacrifice for us because it's in the national interest what national interest it can be to have the backbone of your working population put through this kind of condition where they have nothing to gain themselves and the only people who had to gain was secure in their own middle class and affluent homes with enough food with the capacity to be able to take two or three weeks off or more or three months off and with watching the rest of the country on their television screens going through this kind of scenario, which was completely horrendous. The federal entity did very little to work with the states. The states did not have resources. The states were given different orders morning and evening and several times during the day, these orders were changed dealing with millions of people. So they would be out on the streets, pushed back into, into their uh, tenements, pushed into so-called uh, care centers, which were actually no better than jails and often described almost as jails, told that cases will be, will be lodged against them, hiding in various transport to get home. Um, in what is perhaps been one of the biggest movements since independence of a population in distress, uh, a mass migration in distress of populations. And none of this, none of this was necessary because of the pandemic. It was the pandemic set a stage of terrible and horrible public policy in a so-called democratic framework. Democracy was set aside by a set of disaster management laws, which were nat national, federal, and who had, uh, had as many authoritarian parts to it as do many of the other anti-terrorism laws and others that you will hear from Brinda about. And an ap epidemic act, which has come from the time of the British, which basically says that the state is the only one that can deal with things and it will tell you how best to do it. So you had that kind of federal entity. You had states certainly better than the fed federal government, regardless of which party they were in. But also you had state governments beginning to exercise their authoritarianism in a similar fashion. Because when the police has power, when the police is distributing food, when the police is telling you who can travel, when the police is the only entity that you are meeting, you have seen in the United States or anywhere else across the world, the police's and when they are told that they actually have to keep people inside and indoors, no matter what it is that the conditions are indoors, they just come home and report, we've done our job by making sure no one came out. So it is a relationship which you are in, you, you are actually changing democracy on its head. You had a situation where 
state governments had no money have no money today they are bankrupt i mean we are talking about the last 3 months but i shudder to think about what's going to happen in the next 3 and 6 months they have no money to pay their own salaries of their own staff and how are they going to run any welfare programs at all and you have a situation of a federal entity that has done nothing for recovery this entire 120 million people who are wherever they are they have been given we have food grain stocks of 70 million tons and we are hoarding them and they are rotting and we are not willing to distribute universally to the people who should be getting them we have given little dribs and drabs at each point so this is a situation where actually today people have come and the only program that they are turning to in millions is the national rural employment guarantee act so actually to make a little bit of a parallel in the united states at the great depression time roosevelt did the new deal and the center piece of that new deal was a public works program an employment program where people could come and work at minimum wages to do whatever they had the nrega is a is a something that this government derided but it found that that was the only thing by which at least people could go and get some measure of income so for them to have food security to have some degree of livelihood and to have some degree of health security they are go, they are turning to nrega so that in my state there are about 5 million people at work today on nrega works and in the country there are about 40 million people at work i think i have my numbers right uh so today if we want to look at it in terms of hope where do we go i mean we have really a very very frightening situation which has been created through very poor governance largely created through poor governance we have a situation where for recovery those who can do that recovery there is no idea of an imagination of being able to take people with you and the base of not taking people with you is that you have completely got rid of your democratic ideals you have made the whole of society into an authoritarian uh, mass which has to listen to people at the top and that people at the top are now completely confused they don't know the numbers they don't know how many are getting ill there is an obsession only with the numbers of covid people and that also is continuously throwing people into a safe stage of saying why did we go through all this if it's still continuing to spread at this level and make everyone insecure so whether in urban centers or rural centers actually we need a democratic reawakening and how much the government has hit at whoever was trying to use democracy to make india a more humane and compassionate place Uh, how much that is being threatened through these authoritarian laws i think brinda will give us that idea and then in our question and answers uh, we'll talk but we the only hope is if people actually get together and insist that democratic space will exist uh, and that where that has not yet shown that it has enough space to be able to come forward Thank you Nikhil for that. Uh we're getting some questions from the audience including from Professor Akon Fang who's here at the Ash Center. We're going to take this up after Brenda speaks. Um uh just to introduce her, she is a feminist, a human rights advocate, has spent decades going after state uh, impunity on major human rights cases and played a lead role in the amendments to uh, the criminal law in 2013 in response to the Delhi gang rape. Uh her experience really comes from being rooted in courts uh, on a daily basis fighting these cases. Over to you Brenda. thank you and i thank you erica and uh, i will take forward uh, what both inayat and and i presented as a snapshot and i think uh, very very uh, sharply has been described already by nikhil as to the crisis we were not we were uh, like the rest of the world we also were facing a global public health crisis which was transformed into Uh, a humanitarian human crisis uh, by what uh, uh, very charitably nikhil has described as governance i don't think we should dignify it as governance at all um, and i what i want to um, talk about here is what inayat mentioned that 
the pandemic has reinforced and accelerated the fissures and schisms that predate COVID-19. Uh, I really don't agree that, the, that COVID-19 provides a portal uh, to India or to anyone else to uh, uh, take us, usher us into a better future on its own. Uh, I think in India, it's operating much like quicksand uh, and we're trying to keep our head above water here. And it strikes India at a time when India's institutions are weak or compromised. Society is polarized through political praxis and there has been a relentless assault on civil liberties and freedoms. And we see a growing cult of authoritarianism and concentration of power and the, and the uh, creation of the cult of the leader. Um, what was uh, described just now, I will not repeat that as to how the lockdown, et cetera, was imposed. Both the earlier speakers have mentioned. I just want to add two things to it. As was said here, the legal regime within which this was to operate was uh, we excavated the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897 by the government and the National Disaster Management Act, uh, both of which actually give very wide berth to the executive to take action. It can be argued that a public health crisis is a moment when the executive needs that kind of power uh, to take action. So that would mean that the, uh, the executive has to be responsible towards the health and well-being of all the peoples. If one was to read the, the lockdown, which was described by Nikhil, um, you, the image of the citizen that would emerge would be a citizen who has a roof over his or her head, has a smartphone for sure, and uh, to be able to download whatever app or information the government wishes to pass on to us, and has enough savings and food to be able to stay in for as long as the government is going to ensure an absolute lockdown. And that really was the imagery of the citizen that was in the mind of the executive when the lockdown was imposed. Uh, what we do see is that that imagery or that conceptualization and understanding of citizen was not confined only to the executive. It was soon uh, disclosed that in fact, the judiciary, which became the sole forum uh, in which these issues could be raised. In March, with the imposition of lockdown, parliament was prorogued. So the only forum that was available in a democracy to raise concerns, and the Indian Supreme Court is applauded and celebrated globally, particularly in universities, for the juridical device of social action litigation or public interest litigation, where others can go and represent, particularly the cause of those who can't come forward for their own grievances and fundamental human rights. And that's what took place even at this juncture. And I cannot think of a more appropriate moment for activists to step forward and take forward the concerns of say the migrant workers that Nikhil described to us through the device of the public interest litigation. However, what one did see was that the Supreme Court too seemed to have insulated itself from the lived existence of and the lives of the, of the migrant workers, the poor, and therefore felt that they should defer to the wisdom of the executive. And we saw the emergence of what I would describe as good faith jurisprudence, where all of us, both as citizens were asked to have faith and trust the executive and the court, which is the only forum available to contest, question, examine, and ask questions of executive action and executive decision-making to, at least in the initial period, asked for uh, us, everyone to defer to whatever was placed before the court through the executive. Fortunately, the, uh, and, and, well, fortunately, the court has changed its view on the matter. However, it comes at a very high price as was told to us by Anaya through her snapshot, that it was when lives were lost and the, 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 the kind of uh, tragedy that was played out caused by man-made disaster, not the public health crisis. It was at that moment that high courts and, uh, and even the Supreme Court now has felt compelled to ask certain questions. Moving very quickly on to um, what has this meant in terms of civil liberties and freedoms? So as was told to us by uh, in Ayat, uh, perhaps in the last six years, for the first time, through the protests against uh, a, a divisive citizenship act, uh, we saw the coming together of uh, a very, very powerful movement of civil society 
interestingly and significantly led by Muslim women who reclaimed their space in Indian democracy, not as victims, not as a religious minority, but as citizens. And that movement is a, was a peaceful, democratic, popular movement upholding symbols of the constitution and leaders of the freedom struggle. And that really posed a challenge, I would imagine, to this regime, which has been trying to shape the reshape democracy and the relationship between the, the uh, state and the citizen. The COVID-19 arrives and that becomes an occasion uh, to dismantle, physically, literally dismantle uh, every semblance of that protest, those powerful protests across the uh, country. And also there was some, uh, uh, com some religious communal between religious groups and communal violence that takes place in a part of Delhi just before uh, COVID-19 lockdown takes place. How has that period been deployed? So everything is under lockdown except the police. And the police is an, on overdrive to investigate these cases. One would be delighted if they were actually investigating uh, those who caused the violence because many, much of it is actually available today thanks to mobile phones, which are ubiquitous on video uh, uh, cameras. And what, what, are, what does that show us? That there were hate speeches by members of the ruling party. Those people, however, do not get arrested. Who does get arrested are young student leaders, the youth of the country, which really is the emerging leadership, which is uh, 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 repositioning Indian democracy back within the frame of the Indian constitution and we see that those people have now been targeted and have been put behind bars. Under what law? Under the uh, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, not under the ordinary criminal law. It's important to remember that this law, which is, was draconian by itself, was amended in 2019, August by this government by introducing in it uh, uh, the category of the individual as a terrorist. So you no longer have to be part of any organization, commit any violence, et cetera, et cetera, or espouse any ideology which is violent or, or wants to annihilate the state, et cetera. But the individual can be categorized as a terrorist. This is actually the last nail in the coffin of the kind of dissent that is essential in a democracy. And what we are seeing today is that while access to justice has been whittled down and is reduced to video conferencing, virtual conferencing, that too only in metropolitans, not in other places, uh, the police is acting in a partisan manner and all human rights defenders who are politically opposed to the viewpoint of the government in power are today being uh, um, incarcerated under this draconian law, which makes bail very, very difficult. I want to move very quickly on from there to um, talking a little bit about Kashmir. Uh, while the rest of the country um, experienced lockdown from March when the public health crisis struck us, uh, let us recall that Kashmir was placed under lockdown on the night of August 4th, 5th, 2019 when the Indian government uh, decided to abrogate and reconfigure the special status that Kash uh, Jammu and Kashmir has always had with the Indian state, which is a historical, uh, uh, a result of certain historical events. Since then, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, movement, et cetera, has been completely clamped down. Today, while we are communicating over Zoom, Internet has become like the lifeline of everyone across the globe during the period of COVID-19. It would be important to remember that in Kashmir Valley, till January, internet was not restored. Freedom of press was automatically snuffed out with the absence of internet. And while the, the uh, Supreme Court eventually uh, uh, passed a decision in January of 2020, saying that for purposes of freedom of speech and expression and freedom of trade, we will recognize internet as a protected constitutional right. What has however happened subsequently that they are only permitted 2G rather than 4G with the rest of us across the country and the world enjoy. So uh, on that hinges their right to health, their right to education, in addition to all the other rights that are um, 
that would be available to them. So what is this new form of governance that we are seeing? And this attack, as was mentioned earlier, is not only on, uh, not only peculiar to COVID. COVID has seen all of that getting consolidated and uh, put under a spotlight. What, uh, uh, whether it is in Kashmir or it is across the country, anyone asking a question, and Nikhil is here, has been one of the uh, key players in the formulation of the Right to Information Act uh, of India, which is way superior even to the freedom of information law that you have in the US. One would imagine that at a moment of public health crisis, what in a democracy citizens need are answers. We need to know. We need information on what is available in the public health system, in the hospitals, what are the facilities, et cetera. We need uh, to ask questions of the, of the government in power. Instead, what we are seeing is repeated attempts made by the government to silence any critical comment, either uh, from the media. We've ha we have a, a, a figure put out just uh, yeah, this morning that 55 journalists across the country have faced criminal prosecution for asking questions during COVID-19 on the issue of public health crisis. Uh, so the right to know and the right to information are both being silenced at a moment where I would imagine that they should be uh, further strengthened. The last thing that I want to bring out, and this is something that is taking place globally. Uh, and I think we need to caution ourselves, particularly in relationship to democratic rights. Uh, is this language of uh, war that is being repeatedly used. Uh, in, in India, for instance, from the executive to the popular media, as well as in court, the language being used is, these are the new corona warriors uh, to describe doctors, nurses, and health workers. I fully endorse the position that doctors, nurses, health workers, including sanitation workers, who are the Safai Karamcharis in India, need to be uh, given much more protection, health protection, and other facilities at this juncture. However, the use of the language of war, to my mind, is doing two things. It is one, enabling us to imagine that, well, in a war, there will be some suffering, there will be some collateral damage, and sacrifices must be made. The sacrifice, of course, will be made by the poorest and the most marginalized, as always. The other aspect that this is doing is that you don't ask questions when it is a, a time of war. You allow the government and you do the trade-off and the barter which fear and anxiety fuels between your rights and the authoritarian uh, accumulation and aggregation of power in the hands of the state. So what we are seeing is actually not governance. We are seeing that in the form of a spectacle, the spectacle can be, and this was actually done in India, with uh, army helicopters showering petals over public health hospitals and the army band playing in hospitals at a time when people are dying today in hospitals because our public health facilities are not available. So that if you're going to use either the spectacle or the punitive coercive power of the state, that is today being substituted for any form of governance. The question of accountability and responsibility has become very remote at this juncture. I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Anayat, Nikhil, and Vrinda for that um, fascinating and important overview. Um, and we have a number of questions coming in from the audience, which is great, um, and uh, we'll turn to those shortly. But before we do, I just wanted to uh, hear your comments about one, um, one reflection I had. So um, in many countries, we've started to see in response to the pandemic responses um, of, of their governments, this decline in street action, as you've described, uh, has happened in India as well, but also um, a rise in mutual aid organizations, the establishment of parallel institutions um, for distributing um, you know, medical equipment, personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, things along those lines, and sort of kind of stepping up to provide some of the functions that governments often provide. Um, and, you know, some people have made the argument that this is in some ways a positive development in the context of social movement organization, in part because it starts to raise capacity for longer term 
uh, struggle and, and starts to um, encourage people to think through the problem as one over which they have some collective agency if they cooperate. And um, I was curious to hear your reflections on whether any such activities were going on or were emerging anywhere in India, um, in part because um, you know, the, the challenges that Nikhil described in terms of um, the movement of over 100 million people uh, and the, the other challenges um, to organizing and, and collective action seem incredibly severe in this case. So I was just curious if, if you could reflect a bit um, perhaps uh, first Vrinda and then Nikhil uh, on what you see as uh, happening in this regard or prospects uh, for that type of, of community organizing to take hold in, in the coming weeks or months. Uh, in India too, I think many, many uh, NGOs and other groups have stepped in. Uh, on their own violation simply because they were not going, you know, they, they couldn't be as callous as the state was and watch people uh, dying of hunger, starvation uh, as they travel on foot. So citizens groups, organizations did step in. I'm not very sure that that necessarily uh, translates itself into the next level of political activity uh, because the way it, it is then being seen is the government is like, well, we don't have to actually take responsibility and do this job. Uh, the others can do it. Whereas, as Nickel pointed out, the resources, particularly the financial resources, are concentrated in the hands of the central government. Uh, the, num the amount of food grains rotting in the granaries under lock and key of the state, while citizens are dishing into their pockets to put it out, uh, we, can, we, we are almost uh, uh, you know, providing an alibi to the state today by uh, engaging in this. Not that we shouldn't and we must and we will respond because we are not going to become as unresponsive and insensitive as the state towards our fellow citizens and we will play our part. But I think for it to, to transform itself to a more critical political activity, it, this will not suffice. And I think the state is very happy with us playing this role of putting out food, uh, uh, getting hold of buses, organizing uh, uh, vehicles for people to move, uh, and not allowing us to move into the space where we ask questions of the government. Uh, I think that requires a, a different shift altogether. Nikhil, uh, could you offer some comments on that as well? Yeah, so I have been unmuted, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a very good question, but I think it's something that we'll only, in terms of community organizing, understand a few weeks or months from now. Because we were also, the lockdown was so total that any kind of organizing was impossible. We were under this colonial era, section 144, where more than five people cannot gather. And that was used to keep people indoors and it was used to prevent anyone from raising a voice. It was even used in some ways, even the media was told that you follow whatever the government is doing. And as Brinda said, the Supreme Court also got into that same mode that everything has to be followed. So it was extremely difficult. It still is. We've tried to have protests in rural areas and we've ended up only because at least the Employment Guarantee Act offers work sites where people are there. So while they are working, maintaining distance from each other they're putting up placards or putting stuff on their on their own shirts so that the message can go and they can they can say they're on protest because a minute even if they gather together with distance they are told that you will have the law coming down on you so that that's the kind of condition under which so there is the only thing that could have been done even that was extremely difficult because this health uh, discourse also makes it difficult is distribution of food packets or that kind of welfare activity. And I think one needs to again recognize something that we didn't quite uh, talk about early, I didn't talk about, is that this whole scenario has come into one of the most unequal and growing unequal societies in the world. So the inequalities of India, if there were to be a shift, it's not a few people going out and distributing food grains. It's not a shortage in the country. It is a problem of distribution. It is not a shortage of resources. It's a problem that the private sector has 
concentrated those resources more and more. It's not a question of health facilities not existing. It's that those health facilities are only in the private sector. And that private sector has been pathetic in its response to COVID. It's just run away and it has charged enormous amounts of money. And that is the biggest health crisis they are, we are facing in this country. And it is actually our response as a state and as a ruling class and as all, all those who have money that when this took place, actually, instead of saying labor rights will be greater and more protected, the response by many states was to remove the eight hour working day and say you will work much longer, to remove all labor protection that has taken a hundred years to come, just remove it all overnight through ordinances in various states. So, and the central government egging them on. So it's a, it's a situation of a ruling elite not allowing that kind of space that could have come in a humanitarian, compassionate and an imaginative fashion of being able to deal with these issues. And I must say, because this was a problem, there has been a state. Kerala has actually, as a state, provided a very different example as a, as a regional provincial government. And it has relied a lot on local government and relied a lot on taking the people with them. So even within India, uh, this is a question actually Akon uh, asked, so I did want to refer to it because we should say that there have been these flashes which have been able to show that how much different it could have been if you actually had the state working with people in a far more open, democratic, and partnership fashion or, a, or moving together fashion. I think that that's really interesting. And, and Nikhil, if you could actually respond a little bit more to why you think um, there has been this uh, kind of better governance model in Kerala compared to the other states. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the, the kind of key insights in a lot of the nonviolent resistance literature is that, you know, regimes are never monolithic, that there are always variations in levels of kind of alliance or alignment um, at different phases of government or um, within different ministries or whatever. And, and so, you know, in this case, if, it, if it's a matter of uh, Kerala having a greater autonomy relative to the, um, uh, the, the executive, um, can you explain to our audience a little bit more about why it has been so different in that state? You're on mute again. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, Kerala, there are many reasons and there will be many books written about Kerala uh, and deservingly so. Uh, each state in India is almost like a country in many parts of the world. So it's not a small response, it's, uh, it's important. And many people in India like to say, but oh, Kerala is a different place altogether. And yes, of course it is, but it is that same, same legal constitutional framework within which it works. Uh, it is also very, very tied with resources. It is facing that same situation of not having access to do taxation on its own. And yet, and yet because the political leadership completely applied itself because they looked at public health as public health. Uh, and they saw that this was a health crisis that had to be dealt with, but it was a health crisis that would lead to economic crisis. So no matter how deep they had to go into their pockets, they went to be able to give some kind of support to their own people. And they had an extraordinary local government framework where they said, let local communities understand all the issues have access to the resources that they need to, but they can best take care of illness or food insecurity or income insecurity in their own areas. So you cannot deal with the size of India sitting in one place. And obviously the best way is to invest in your own local people and invest in many ways, not just in resources, by providing enough information, by providing access at each level to health that needs to be done. The Kerala health minister has become famous again across the world because she again has led by going in, by showing, not hiding. That's another thing that many people in government have gone into hiding. I mean, you cannot govern, you cannot provide food and you cannot provide health by sitting 
far away from people. So yes, you need to take protection like frontline workers. You are a frontline worker. As a politician, you're a frontline worker. Otherwise, you shouldn't be one. And those, those are the kinds of things that, that we have seen in Kerala right across and getting the government led by trying to say we need continuously saying we need to come together and there were things that they did they did incredibly good tracking they don't have such huge resources but they had been through one pandemic not pandemic but one virus before the i think the ebola one and they figured out exactly how to, it, to, it had to be done. They realized that extensive testing is extremely important to know what's going on rather than hide from it. And that's what's kept them going. So even though there's been a second wave, they were the first ones to get the virus in India and the first ones to control it. And they've had some of the best figures on the health front. But as a society, they have dealt with it with compassion. And they were the first ones to say that the migrant workers are not migrants, they are our guests because actually they are workers who are helping our economy. So it's not just a question of tech terminology, it's also a question of how you reach out and you, you deal with it. And that's why Kerala has stood out and stood, stood different from the rest of the country. And I think that is something the people of Kerala also deserve the, the, the credit for all their years of putting in whatever they have done, but the government of Kerala also deserves credit for taking the people and their energies with it. And that's what uh, distinguishes one province from another. And the trouble is that you need to give more power to the provinces and allow them to do things and even more to local self-government. And only then can you deal with the months that are going to come. Uh, Very interesting. And it also sounds like, um given the fact that there's this other case in which uh, people can imagine an alternative path of effective governance that's kind of bottom up, uh, that this is the type of information that the, the central Indian government would want, not want very many people uh, to understand. Uh, so Vrinda, can you talk a little bit about um, the degree to which these alternative models of good governance are widely understood um, and might be a focus point uh, for um, more concrete demands about uh, better governance in states outside of Kerala? Um, I think that's uh, where part of our problem lies. Uh, what we do have today, and this is not new, it didn't happen with COVID, it again goes back. And I think very much like Kerala really has its foundations in people's democracy and uh, the conversation between the uh, government and the people in Kerala, whether through local self-governance or otherwise, uh, started way back, a few decades back, when these pillars had already been put in place and therefore they could take off and respond to the crisis when it uh, uh, came upon them. Um, what we had in, in, the, in other parts of the country, more importantly, for quite some years now, we have the media parroting what the central government, uh, the BJP uh, NDA government wants it to say, there is, um, there, there is a very, very little independent media. The reach of the independent media is extremely minuscule, does not necessarily penetrate into uh, the, to the towns, the villages, in the language that people know and understand. And therefore, uh, what is actually going in is propaganda. It's not information, it's not news, it's not uh, a conversation where people will debate and discuss. Um, and therefore, while we keep calling ourselves the largest democracy, which is actually more, uh, it, it's, it's about quantity and not quality, uh, what we are not seeing is uh, this, this uh, uh, rigorous debate. And the lack of debate is partly because uh, the media is compromised, uh, the media is compromised increasingly with the privatization of media uh, by a few uh, uh, big industrial houses, which are, have their own proximity for very obvious reasons with the government in power. Um, and a very, very uh, well-structured, well-oiled, well-funded um, propaganda machinery across social media. And that's the other thing that social media platforms provide. While it does provide everybody 
uh, a way to communicate, to put forth what you say, the amplification of that voice is obviously not equal for everyone. And um, whether it is to silence certain voices, whether it is to label and brand certain views, or it is to uh, amplify a particular viewpoint, even though it may be based on complete uh, false information, not even misinformation, is a, a serious problem today that India is confronting. And in a democracy, people are going to form their views and eventually cast their vote based on what they've heard, what they've thought, what they know. And therefore, if what you are fed is actually false, wrong information, whether it is about certain groups and communities, particularly religious minorities, or it is about the achievements of a government, or it is about uh, the truth about of what is happening under COVID-19 and who is responsible, and whether this is the, for instance, the, the exodus of uh, the millions of workers uh, walking home, whether this is just something that happens inevitably and uh, there's nothing anybody should be asked to do. Uh, that conversation we are unable to have because of this. So media is part of the problem, the compromised colluding media. The other part of the problem is that uh, anyone who has a contrary viewpoint, anyone who challenges uh, has to do this at high risk today. So while we have seen some of our most prominent human rights defenders and activists, uh, not only this time round, post the anti-CA struggles, we have seen uh, young uh, men and a lot of young women uh, being incarcerated under draconian anti-terror laws. Prior to that, we saw two years ago um, in, in what is called the Bhima Koregaon conspiracy, another set of uh, very prominent human rights defenders and activists who have always worked with the most marginalized and poor and uh, uh, challenged the policies and decisions of uh, uh, the government, including the private sector. We, this is not just a government acting in isolation. There is definitely a private sector that stands to gain from uh, enf enforcing this kind of draconian regime. Uh, so asking, having that conversation is today a risk because you will have cases slapped against you. You can, the likelihood of arrest, including of senior journalists today is, is there apart from being trolled maligned, abused across social media. So dissent today is coming at a high price and forget dissenting from a government policy, questioning today has become very difficult. I think that leads us into another one of the questions that we have coming from the audience uh, with regard to the role of the police. Um, and when you were talking earlier about the um, incarcerations that have been taking place and in, with increasing rapidity uh, under the, the lockdown, um, I, I sort of had the question myself of um, the degree to which the police are autonomous from or more and more closely aligned with uh, the, the BJP um, and the central government. Um, you described them earlier, Verinda, as partisan. Um, and uh, so could you talk a little bit about the history of um, police alignment in India with more kind of Hindu nationalist goals uh, perhaps, or at least just with loyalty to the central government and whether there's any scope for variation in local police departments in terms of their loyalty to the center? Sure. So Erika, I would actually begin this history from the uh, com the, the very uh, cozy relationship between any political party that is in power and the police. It did not, it was not invented by the, by the, the Hindu right. Um, this has always been the case in India and every party when in power has exploited this to uh, target their political opponents. And of course, uh, human right defenders, civil liberty activists are the opponents, uh, uh, are seen as opponents by every party which is in power. And the, uh, actually uh, uh, the police in India uh, is governed by a British uh, law of 1861, which obviously in colonial era, you would want the police under you. It's been a long uh, time conversation, including judgment of the Supreme Court saying, we need a police reform. We need the police to be insulated from the executive. No uh, uh, executive or either uh, central or state is interested actually creating that autonomy for the police to act. Um, 
However, what we have, uh, uh, having said that, I think what we do see in the last few years, and there is now evidence to that effect, is that as the uh, uh, as the as a large population of the country has taken a turn for the right and increasingly uh, aligned their views with the, the Hindutva Hindu right ideology, we see that there is what I would describe as an institutional bias in the police today against um, Dalits who are seen as the outcasts, against Adivasis who will be the indigenous populations and religious minorities, particularly the Muslims. Uh, and they are therefore targeted. Um, if so would people be of certain ethnic uh, minorities. And that institutional bias leads to a greater incarceration. Figures today do show a disproportionate uh, incarceration of these uh, groups and classes in uh, Indian prisons, particularly as under trials. Surveys have shown that there is a bias um, uh, surveys done by NGOs that there is a bias uh, in the law enforcement uh, authorities. We do, we are in the state uh, is in denial of this problem. So we are not addressing it at all. Unlike the US, for instance, the percentage of um, say Muslim uh, uh, persons in the Indian police is 2%. Uh, and this is the, the statute, something close to that is what has been there for quite some time again, that is not something new that has happened. So in order to even address the problem, in, ad, in order to revamp, in order to have uh, a conversation from within and outside is, uh, uh, is difficult because uh, we have a, a, almost a monolith kind of syst, uh, structure that is at work. The accountability mechanisms are extremely low. Um, if we have uh, what we call in India uh, encounter killings, which is basically extrajudicial executions which are conducted for which uh, uh, heaven and earth has to be moved uh, by the victim in order to get any kind of inquiry or investigation going. It does not happen on its own. Uh, torture is rampant even in ordinary times. Forget extraordinary situations of protest, etc. Uh, cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment and torture are euphemism for interrogation and investigation in India. And of course, it's not done to everybody. It will be done to again to select classes, and the poor are always targeted, uh, easy prey for this kind of uh, 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 behavior. So the uh, the even for instance, there have been many cases where one has been able to expose the uh, manner in which uh, the police has conducted an extrajudicial execution or tortured somebody. The next step that is supposed that is to be taken to hold them accountable, to punish them, whether through administrative disciplinary measures or otherwise, that we see both uh, uh, the government as well as uh, the, the judiciary stop short of it. There almost seems to be uh, an unease that, you know, we, we can't, what is popularly called in India, uh, let's not uh, um, demoralize the forces by holding them to account to the rule of law. Uh, and so even as we see, and I see questions to that effect, even as we see, and I want uh, to take this occasion to express uh, my deep solidarity and respect for the Black Lives Matters protests that are, have taken place across the US. And I want to say here that they inspire all of us across the world when we see uh, uh, movements like this uh, uh, and, and people in large numbers protesting and holding uh, others to account. Uh, this kind of um, protest on the issue of police brutality or torture, while it is rampant, it's actually been uh, something that, that for the better part of my uh, adult working life, I've always wondered that, you know, this is an issue that actually um, is, impacts everybody in our society. And yet we, it doesn't bring us together. We don't come out on the streets and demand an end to torture. And uh, uh, you know, even in this case, it was uh, the horrific killing uh, of George Floyd, which did this. So I don't know what is the tipping point in any society uh, that brings people out and brings people together. But there seems to be a lot of, uh, there is of course a lot of sanction and uh, by the state for police brutality, but there appears to be a lot of condonation of it even within society. 
And I often wonder whether it is due to our, uh, our society being very heavily caste-based, which not only stratifies us in different hierarchies, but also um, gives an explanation or a rationale for why some people will have to be dealt with violently. But I do hope that these struggles inspire uh, um, similar resistance, uh, nonviolent democratic protests uh, across the, uh, the country here too uh, on issues of police brutality and torture. Thank you, Vrinda. Uh, Nikhil, I would love to, to hear your reflections on whether you see prospects um, for some such mobilization, say against police brutality or, or broader pro-democracy protests as the lockdown begins to lift, uh, given what you've observed so far. Uh, and then we'll do one final round of, uh, of questions after your response. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Brinda, I think dealt with the issue of police and the police itself. I just want to say or underscore one point that she had made that that the police being able to be an instrument of the political party in power makes it that much worse. Uh, there is one thing about general police reform itself, which certainly a country like India needs and many countries, I think, across the world need it. Uh, but the, the very close proximity between the executive and the police really makes it extremely difficult and makes it in, in, in a democratic framework to be able to have the police not end up taking order to be taking the side of the, of the ruling party, whichever it may be. And it gets worse and worse under more and more authoritarian conditions. And that is something that we are really seeing in India today. And uh, it's something that we need to deal with. Because when it comes to issues that are political in the sense of what that ruling party sees as its core issues and fundamental issues, you end up seeing the police actually following that particular diktat. And that completely messes up what are normal democratic processes where the police has a very extremely important role to stay clear of those questions. Uh, and even if, if there is, a, is uh, all that Vrinda describes, the various biases that exist right across society, they exist in, police, in the police as well, but this puts an extra bias on the side of the ruling party. And when there is an authoritarian situation, then it also puts the police on the side of the agenda of the ruling party which is an extremely dangerous thing and, and very difficult for any form of resistance to what that ruling party may want to do, even in terms of constitutionalism and the constitution itself. Um, but I think the latter part of your uh, question about generally organizing, I mean, there is going to be an immense, incredible crisis in the days ahead. People are going to have no, to have no choice but to organize and they are going to come out on the streets. The question is that in that organizing, how much is Indian democracy going to give them the right kind of space and how much is the state going to be able to reach out? Um, Kerala is actually a left government, but that left government also worked with the opposition and worked with the people. We saw in Rajasthan, the government uh, did try, there was a question also asking about various social accountability measures that we have worked in in the, on, in the past. Has there been any space for those kinds of measures during this lockdown for people's monitoring, for accountability? And in fact, in Rajasthan, we found many of those measures have been taken forward and that's what's helped. Every bit of relief that's passed is on the website, is accessible to all. Any complaint goes and the complaint is also completely in public domain and can be tracked. So these are things that were worked on over many years. And if that government tries to take advantage of it, it can 
deliver much better. And as a result of that, there is a very quick response time on a food or on a health issue from the most remote village because there is that whole loop that has been put in by the state itself. You can't come out on the streets, but at least you can pick up a phone and people can see what's on that, what message you have passed, and you can put that in public domain. And so, therefore, you can operate some measure of democracy in a different way. Right now, we have to get out of our homes and we have to be able to, and there are going to be protests. Yes, obviously, certain measures have certain care has to be taken, certain measures have to be, uh, we, people themselves are actually aware of those measures and are taking them. But I think a lot depends if the state is going to keep throwing these colonial and autocratic laws at the people then you are going to have a horrendous situation of not being able to deal with the crisis, nor being able to deal with the, the concerns of people that are coming out of the crisis. And they're going to be with very odd everyday things, with health, with food, with education, which is completely collapsed. And we can see a huge new generation going to come in because one lot is going to rely on being online and being able to learn from home and from online. So like stay at home, stay and work at home. It's also stay at home and stay and learn at home. But there are many people who can't do that. And so we have greater inequalities coming in down the line. And unless what has been India's greatest, at least our experience of being able to get things with people, get things done with people, imagination as we move forward of how we deal with a crisis, how we deal with Today, a situation where we don't know how the state is going to be able to cope. We don't know how people are going to be able to cope with you in huge numbers. Uh, we are going to have to look towards democracy to help. And if democracy is not given the space, then what will come in the nature of people's protests? And if one hopes there that the police, it is not going to be a huge amount of repression because um, that will be most unfortunate to be to the to the sphere of where we can really carry people with us and emerge with solutions. Excellent, thank you. So uh, we're just about out of time, but I did want to ask you uh, each to offer one reflection. As you know, this uh, webinar series is uh, hoping to curate lessons uh, for activists around the world, and so if you had um, one key takeaway from your recent experience uh, in India that you want people to know elsewhere who are struggling for justice where they live, uh, what do you think the one key takeaway is? And Nikhil, we can start with you and, and then go to Vrinda. So I would say, I mean, in, within one, I'm going to put three very uh, uh, big things in very short sentences. Uh, one is that we have to see this moment of crisis and challenge as one of an opportunity to reorder society. There was too much wrong, even without the crisis. So this has pulled it over a tipping point to bring out that crisis in the public, and we must seize that opportunity, number one. And that, to me, is across the world, not just in India. Number two, what we have led, what we have gone with as a neoliberal framework of development, a uh, global framework which has been thrust upon many parts of the world, including India, with growth as, as the overriding market, growth as the overriding factor, that has disappeared in three short weeks. It has, it's so superficial. It's collapsed. It does not have any foundational power. And that must be replaced with something that is more sustainable and equitable and it has many things that it has exposed. So that's my second issue. And the third is that we have seen that the privatization of basic services, we have seen its collapse in health. We need the role of a democratic state where the state takes responsibility for certain basic things. That's what a democracy is, not just the space to say what you do, but also to deliver on basic things. And learn those lessons of, of that time. And this is something, again, globally true. We need transparency. We need accountability. We need people's participation. And we need a state that says we will take responsibility for food, for health, for livelihood. Wonderful. Rinda. OK, so first, I'll strongly endorse everything 
uh, that Nikhil has said here, because I think that really lays the foundation uh, on which not just India, but globally we'll have to, and we know these systems are all economically and otherwise interconnected. I'll only add that with climate change very much lurking around us, um, unless we are going to have the economist and the ecologist and others sit together on the table, uh, we are not going to get ourselves out of this mess anytime. Um, I think in, a, in, in, uh, in terms of democracy and law and, and rights, what I would say is we really need to, uh, democracy we know has been hollowed out. People have called, are calling certain countries illiberal uh, democracies or regimes are being called illiberal, uh, illiberal democracies. I think we need to move beyond the ritual of casting a vote uh, every five years or whatever. Uh, people have to reclaim that democracy. The democracy has to have peoples at the center of it. Today, the state with all its paraphernalia of power, with its punitive uh, uh, power and coercive arm has occupied that central place. And we are all floundering and begging around it. We need to get ourselves as citizens at the heart and center of it. Um, the, and this really is, a pro, is an opportunity to ask those questions and re-educate ourselves and perhaps re-educate the governments about what this, uh, this process is. And therefore it can happen in multiple creative ways across platforms. It's not confined to any one way. Different people will take it forward in different ways. Uh, there is uh, the only, at least speaking particularly for India, the opposition to authoritarian right-wing government today in India comes from the ordinary people of this country. There is no political party today providing opposition to the ideas and the, the manner in which the country is being run. It is from the people of this country, it is from the youth of this country who have a vision where they want the constitutional vision to be rein, uh, reinstated. So, and which we, we saw the blossoming of it just recently and now we are seeing the demonizing and criminalizing of it. What we need to do perhaps is how do we build solidarities? The, uh, we are divided by our concerns, by our uh, sectors, uh, uh, by, uh, by movements. We need this intersectional, intersectoral solidarities to be strengthened. We don't have to all agree, but we need to see how do we work together uh, uh, and what, is, what are our alliances like. And those alliances will have to be from the local to the global, uh, uh, whether it is about outbreak of war, or it is about forms of economy, or it is about ecological uh, uh, parameters that we will set. These will have to be global conversations, uh, which we need to re reignite and we need to uh, replace them and make them the at the center. For too long, these conversations have, be have been seen as things that activists do on the fringe of democracy. This has to come to the heart of democracy and we, sh we cannot come out of this without constantly interrogating the nature of democracy. And I don't think uh, uh, that's, that's difficult or hard to do. Uh, I think we need to uh, form alliances in, in many, many uh, places and allow new leadership to come, uh, come forward. Wonderful. Anaya, uh, closing reflection from you. Well, um, I always learn so much while listening to you speak. Um, Thank you for laying out that big picture. I think for people listening and for us in policy school, we tend to focus on issue areas. So it was really good for you all to bring in and for us to hold together really the big picture and all the work that needs to be done. I know you're both very busy. So thank you for your time and like for your commitment and for all the work that you do every day. Thank you, Anayat. And thanks to everyone who's been with us watching. Um, I want to thank also Vrinda and Nikhil uh, and Anayat for curating such an amazing conversation. And uh, especially Vrinda and Nikhil for your accommodation around time zone uh, issues. And um, uh, thanks again to the Car Center, the Car Center staff, and to the Topol Family Foundation for their support of the uh, Topol webinar series and the fellowship in general. Uh, and um, we'll see you next time.